Welcome to the Joe Kilgallen podcast, aka Kilgallen's Pub. I'm your host, stand up comedian, Chicago native, handsome son of a bitch, Joe Kilgallen. Good to be back on the podcast. Uh, as always, I like to start with a little gratitude. Let's give a shout out to all the Patreon subscribers. You guys are amazing. Love you very much. Latest bonus pod for you, Patreon subscribers, is Joe Kilgallen's top five favorite cereals. So please, uh, if you're not a Patreon subscriber, jump on that patreon.com slash Joe Kilgallen. And for those of you who already subscribed, tell me what I got right and what I got wrong. I want to I want to fucking fight with you. Let's go. I hope everyone had a great weekend. I sure as shit did. Uh, shout out to the Laugh Factory, a bunch of great shows there with a ton of great comics. I'll uh, I'll talk more about that. I got a Patreon bonus episode coming out later, so I'll tell you some fun stuff from that. But I'm also very excited. That's why I'm talking so fast. I'm very excited to have a guest on the podcast again. Took a week off from having a guest last week. Starting to get in the rhythm of having guests back on. It's been fun instead of just listening to myself ramble like a dick. It's uh, one of my favorite podcast hosts in the game. He hosts a great podcast. He's an awesome stamp comedian who recently recorded his second soon to be second uh stand-up comedy album uh everyone let's welcome back to the podcast the one and only mike bridenstein thank you joe let's go close with it with the camera angle let's get give me in get me close in here people gotta see this yeah dude i want to thank you first of all i love that brooklyn hat you're wearing it's a, the thank brooklyn you. dodger hat's always a cool hat thank you yeah i also want to thank you for doing the podcast because when i texted you earlier you weren't feeling well I canceled my show today because I was I, I something's wrong with me. I don't know if I have COVID. Uh, I hope not. I mean, I hope not. <laughs> well, you'll be have, okay. You're. I haven't gotten COVID. I know you got classic right away. Like I know that you've had it. I still. I'm one of those guys that's like still having. It's like a moment of pride for me, like to be able to brag I haven't gotten it. Oh hell yeah, man! So I don't want it. I don't want it. You got to feel like Superman. Everyone in the world's got it, essentially. At least everyone you know, probably. And you still haven't been touched by it. Yeah. My wife got it. I slept in the same bed with her. Didn't touch me. Dude, I felt that way, too. My wife and kids got it, and I didn't get it. But then I think I originally had it like you talked about. I was misdiagnosed. I think I was one of the first people to actually have it, because I was knocked on my ass for a few days. I remember. March you, you, had, you had influenza A? Yes. I remember. You're a good friend. Yeah. And you host a great podcast called Hunk with Mike Bryanstein. I failed yes. to mention that in the intro. Yes. It is it's a, a panel podcast where you have some of the best names in comedy and some also people, some movers and shakers in some other fields all together. And you basically talk about the topics of the day. And it's really fun. And I love being on it. I'll be on it next month. Yeah. And you were on the live version at the Lincoln Lodge in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. Yes. I heard you and Mike Burns recapping and talking about it. <laughs> I was wondering if you would listen to that because it was I so I tried to be delicate with it because the whole thing is like you did nothing wrong, but it, but everybody's like, oh, he's in trouble. So I was trying to explain like how that happened. I was I was like, oh, man, like if he gets mad about this, I can explain my way out of it. But I don't think that he will. Oh, no, I didn't think you guys said anything too bad. Um, Burns a little bit. You know me better than Burns does, and I love Mike Burns. He didn't say anything bad. He was just a little bit like, Joe, ooh, ugh, the ice is thin, my friend. Like, that was his kind of – Um, but, like, I know Allie Drapos really well, or Allie and, and I are you buddies. Played, you played into it. Like, you knew yeah. what to do in that situation. Everything was great. I didn't recap this for the listeners, though. So what Mike Bryant and I are referring to, Mike was in Chicago two weeks ago now, I believe, and uh, recorded his album and did a bunch of uh, other shows. And he did his podcast, Hunk with Mike Bryanstein Live. I was part of the panel along with Adam Burke, hilarious comedian who's been on this podcast. Mike Burns, also a very funny comedian who has a podcast called uh, Power, uh, moves. Power Moves. Power Moves. I almost called it Dad Moves, but it's called Power Moves. His Power Twitter moves, is yeah. at Dad Boner. That's correct. There you go. So, uh, and then Ali Drapos, who's also been on this podcast, who's a hysterical comedian. And so, um, we were taught you asked the question, what's the biggest bomb you've ever had as a comedian on stage? And I told a story about I did pause at a bad point. I said Megan Gailey brought me out to open for her in like 2012. And I did say it was in Lyme, Ohio, which is a very conservative area. Uh, they even mentioned don't talk politics because we love, you know, Romney or whoever, uh, or McCain, <laughs> whoever got, I can't remember what year it was. Simpler, simpler times. Yeah, simpler times. I think it was 2012, so it was Romney. They love Anyhow, Mitt um, Romney in Lima, Ohio. Right. So I, I mentioned, I said, Megan brought me to the show. What she didn't mention was it was going to be 800 women. 
And right away, Allie jumped at it, which she should have because I left it floating and she did a great thing. She was hilarious about it. But I had two choices. I either go, no, no, I didn't mean that. I paused for a beat and look, it was 800 women, but they were 55 to 80, which is true. Weird age range for anybody. I mean, a 22 year old female comic would be like, I don't want to perform for that demo. And it's always weird when it's just one group represented, you know, all women, because cer certain jokes, you need both sides to be like the laugh off each other like oh that's true women do that or you men are fucking pigs like you kind of need that i used the two hackiest examples just then but right right um, right you you need you that. want you need, you, need, you need conflict and the women and the men looking at each other and that's what you do relationship material not for one side you do it so there's like an interaction absolutely absolutely totally so uh but no ali nailed me and it was really funny but i you, when you're in that situation you have two choices you either fight it by being like no 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 hold on hold on or you lean into it which is why i did where i was like oh i gave them chocolate to calm them down i blah blah, blah. you know i made it i made myself sound more like a sexist pig it was, amazing. it was great which i think is the play and i think when you do that people know like oh yeah he's it's like the um i have this joke on instagram you've heard it and i actually brought it back i, I stopped doing it because it was a holiday joke and i thought oh the farther away from the holiday it's a joke about juneteenth I did it over the weekend and it's it, a great joke. It's a great thank joke. Thank you. Thank you. And it and it did murder to the point where I felt like, oh yeah, I should keep doing this as long as I can before, you know, by Christmas, I probably can't do it anymore. But um it, it was funny because people asked, was there ever any blowback? I'm like, no, because people know that I'm joking. I've established myself as being silly. One time I did it where I, I thought I got a little bit of like, ooh, was because the crowd wasn't as diverse. You want whenever you mention race at all, you want the most diversity possible. And yes. I've noticed in those situations, black and Hispanic, whoever the white people laugh the least is what I should say. Yeah. White people don't want to think that they're laughing at other races. Like they, they definitely don't want to feel that way for the most part. If they're a good person, it's just comes out of them not wanting to be a piece of shit, which is fine. Yeah, I get that. I mean, that's, the thing of the world right now is, um, you know, you hear something and I, and look, everyone's guilty of it a little bit. You hear it, you're like, oh shit, do I? Where do I? Where do I stand on this? Okay, I saw a theory which is Twitter. I mean, this is probably an old theory, but I hadn't thought of it till somebody, whoever it was, worded it. It was Louis C.K. It was Louis C.K. on a. He's promoting his movie, and I watched. Uh, sorry, everybody, I watched his interview because it's interesting when he talks about comedy. Don't agree with jacking <laughs> off in front of people. It's funny you even have to say that. Like people should assume you don't endorse that. And he is a smart guy when it comes to talking about comedy. I don't think anyone can deny that. But I, I mean, hear if, you if, if anybody's I like he's you. not funny, okay, we are we are done talking. Yeah, you know what I mean. If you're like, I, and I never thought he was funny. Mm, we're done talking. He yeah, I hate when people he, do that. He got canceled because he jacked off in front of people, and it wasn't good like so that's what he's funny that's why he fills theaters so he's and he was look and here's something he was even initially funny when he started jerking off in front of people which is why they didn't say no right away every testimonial the women were like at first we were like what the fuck is he I'm doing sure and then we're like, oh this is wrong stop it there's no scenario where you expect that so yeah uh if he did in front of me like I mean, listen if he if it happened to my wife or my sister or my mom obviously you get like a visceral reaction so it's obviously like god damn i'm just digging i feel like i'm you digging a hole right now it's wrong oh no 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 it's no you're, no i know what you're saying if it had if it had yes if it had it's wrong sure it was bad let's let's be clear what it did was bad good at comedy good at comedy that's all okay. that needs to be said so he's all of that just to be like he was talking about on twitter people give heartfelt opinions at the same time they post their jokes so those that's the reason, in his opinion, that those two things got conflated. I, so if, yes. you're, if you're like women and blah, 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 the same breath, you're like um, like a joke, like a bit about it. So it's like if, if all of this is brain dump is happening in the same place, comedians who are giving non-comedic heartfelt things or – or the fact that we're getting both in the same place is fucking up everybody's perception. And that's why everybody's overreacting to everything. I mean, it's I a agree. little bit more heightened and everything just because of social media to begin with. The country's a little bit more divided. And that's by design. But but yeah, if a comic is... is I, I think that 
I am going to, I have, and I, I, I don't really use Twitter that much, but he's right. Like, no one's like, what does Brido think about this situation? You don't want, no one wants that. I don't want that. Like, and I'm embarrassed when I have done it in the past. So it's like, make a joke or shut the fuck up to, to myself. Everybody else can do what they want. But I think that I'm going to start with the man in the mirror. Another person who is good at singing, but I don't agree with what it is. <laughs> By the way, Michael Jackson fans, man. And I'm a huge Michael Jackson fan. But myself and uh, comedian Mike Leibovitz were on this podcast. And we were talking, talking about, about my dick. Love that dude. Yeah, he's known his catchphrase, whip my dick. And we were talking about Michael Jackson's songs. He goes, dude, MJ was trying to tell us something. Think about it. I'm talking to the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. I'm bad. I know it. I'm a smooth criminal. Like all these like things. And I'm like, damn, dude, you know, holy shit. And, th and this was a thought he had had years and years ago. So yeah, he yeah. just was able to throw it into our conversation on the podcast. And it made me laugh. So I shared it. And the number of people were like, fuck you. He was innocent. I'm like, guys, I'm the biggest MJ. I love MJ. Huge Michael Jackson fan. It's a joke. We're just being silly with some song titles here. Let's slow it down a little bit. People go for the jugular. You know, there's no, um, and there's, that's another yeah. thing too. It's all emotion, too much emotion, not enough like thought and logic. And again, we're all guilty of it, but I would like comedy club audiences that if your instinct is to laugh, let that instinct come. That's why we're later. there, right? That's we're here. We're breaking all of the rules at a roast. Somehow people get that at a roast. People are like, oh, there's going to be some fucked up shit. It's going to get weird. At a comedy club, it should be the same thing. Yeah. Like, don't groan. I know that that's, I know that we're like, if we're in the the lobby of the club, groan. I don't give a shit. Groan, be a person. Not in the room. And this is Thunderdome or whatever people, like, this is no holds barred. This is not where you act like, this, this is not where you're, this is where we forget about all that stuff. Like, don't. Obviously, be, I mean, have an inner compass or whatever. But if you feel like, well, I don't know about that one, or ooh, risky, trust, trust that they're going to go somewhere, like, comedic with it. Like, it's, I know that there's some give and take and there's some tension and shit like that. But, god damn, man, people are understandably edgier, but we should have still, like, a place not to be heinous, not I'm not like one of these people, but just light up every every light up. I agree. Everything you said was dead on, and I almost wonder if we need to have uh, the host or first comedian <laughs> kind of remind the audience to start shows. Like, hey, we're here. Like they always say, some comedian had a riff about this, where it's like, there's a time and a place for everything. This is the time and the place. You might hear some shit you don't agree with. You might hear some shit where you're like, that's wrong, but funny. And, and that's the way it goes. And you're right. Most comedians, the vast majority of stand-up comedians are coming from a good place with their jokes. I really do believe a good, I mean, the ones you'd see at any book show that has any kind of respectable reputation, at least. Obviously, yeah. at open mics, you're going to get, it's a fucking open mic. You know what I mean? It's not, but like, it's no, you know, it's, they let anybody with uh, anything come off the street and say whatever they want. Yeah. And even on the national stage of like comedians who sell tickets, there's only a handful who are really going out of their way to be intentionally uh, douchey and stuff like that. You know, you have to do a better job about curating shows. If you're going to say, I mean, that being said, I think that it is good to a certain extent that people got a little touchier about things in general. And I think that that's good. More empathy is good. I think it made us work harder, not um, go after easy targets. It made us like get better as comics. And I think that that's good too. So I see both sides of it. I'm just like, I don't want them to do it to me, just me. They can do it to everybody else. That's what I think. That's what I, my main concern is me. And then, you know, if they don't do it to me, then, Hey, what's the problem? You know? I agree, man. I agree. Um, empathy is interesting. I think that's something that we don't see enough of in the world today. I think, and that's the problem with Twitter, which is why I've grown to Twitter was fun for a while. I think what I loved about Twitter was uh, I, the breaking I never news. Thought, I never thought Twitter was fun. Oh, never. I mean, I breaking I news. A, you're right. You're right. You're right about a breaking stretch news. where it was yeah. kind of fun, where it's like you're getting breaking news, sports updates. You know, I, I used to play fantasy football and I mean, you and I would do a baseball podcast together. Yeah. So you'd get yeah. information that's in quick. 
because right. I think Twitter started off. What helped Twitter grow quickly in the beginning was they had celebrities on board because it was pitched to them as this is your own press releases. Right. You could control the narrative. You could do this. And so everyone's like, oh, this is great. They get on board and they'd be like, you know, it's the rock being like, hey, I now take this new muscle juice. Fucking take some muscle juice with me. It's my nut. I nut in this cup and now it's yours. Legalize I it. Going. I say, I say legalize it. Yeah. Right. Legalize buying the rocks come. <laughs> Should be, I don't know why it's not already. Come on, Biden. You know, and <laughs> he might flip Texas if he legalized drinking the rocks come. He's the I, I, I think he should, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but then it became everyone's opinion all the time, and nuance started to go away uh, because originally it was just 140 characters. Now that's 280. I don't think it's much better. But, dude, I, I don't see any empathy anymore. And here's an example Olivia Rodrigo, the singer who has a couple hit songs. Um, I know the one song was really big. What the fuck is it called? You know what I'm talking about Olivia Rodrigo. She has a song. I know who uh, she. I know who she is. I don't know. Good I mean, for like, you. It's like good for you. You look happy and healthy. I can't sing, and neither could she apparently, because there's a bunch of live footage of her going around all over Twitter the last couple of days, mm -hmm. where people are just slamming her. She gets on stage with Billy Joel to do something, and even Billy at one point kind of had a look like what the hell, and then he kind of he, but he's smart. As soon as he had the look, he caught himself and then started smiling because he's he knows all of a sudden, his brain went off going, dude, there's cameras everywhere. Don't not have a smile on your face and you don't want to be caught, but he got caught. Um, but everyone just trashing the hell out of this poor girl. She's like 19, 20. Maybe she can't sing, but in my head, I'm like, do we have to, must we always have this happened, first... to, this happened to Beyonce. The board feed came out. She weathered that storm. Guess what? It's hard to sing. I don't know. I don't know who this woman is. I'm sure that she's got, she's going to have the same shelf life as the rest of these teen stars. Who cares? Yeah, I don't care either. I just think of it more of like, I just wish more people would think, why do I have to pile on to? Now, this is a thing that I read recently is like the end of social media. Social media, meaning when you put this out, you are broadcasting this to the people that follow Joe Kilgallen and the people who are friends with the people who follow Joe Kilgallen. So that is your network. Now with TikTok and the way that people are copying TikTok, the algorithm is like, I'm going to recommend this to you based on what you like. It has nothing to do with your, basically you are hindered by your network. So if you put out the best thing ever in a social network, it's still only going to get to like the people, the audience that you have and until you are whatever, a Jenner, you like are going to, going to have like a limited reach this way. If this shit is good and people who have seen it are like, that's good it'll immediately be recommended. That's why you're like, if you put out a reel on Instagram, it'll go through bursts where it's like, why do I have 50 likes today? Oh, they pushed out some fucking video I put out, some reel I put out like a while ago. So it's now it's like, I think it's called like suggestion media or the, the person who wrote the article was talking about it, how social media is going to die. Facebook is number one still. If Facebook goes to this TikTok model of recommendation media then the social network aspect of it, like seeing your friends' kids' pictures and and that sort of thing, kind of goes away. And now you're getting like a more curated to you type of thing. I think that's a better experience. I think it's a because, better experience too. Because I know I I read something similar, but not a whole article. It was just a couple paragraphs of something. And Twitter and Facebook in particular, and Instagram until recently. What they would do was Twitter, especially that Twitter goes, here's what's trending. Uh -huh. Here's what people that he likes is talking about. Yeah. So we're going to show him this because it's got the most people talking about it right now. Yeah. But I don't like stuff. There's a number of times where I see an article where I'm like, I don't like this shit, you right. know, right. where I think TikTok was doing where it's like, oh, well, he just liked the ending scene to Avengers Endgame for the fifth time again. So now we're going to show him content creators who specialize in Marvel Cinematic Universe content. Oh, he also likes uh, the Beatles. So here's some Beatles clips. Right. And then it makes it a more enjoyable experience instead of seeing shit where it's like, oh, people from high school don't like that student loans are going to get uh, 10 grand taken off. And now yes. I, why am I seeing this? You know? Yeah, right. It's not set up to make you angry either. Like, it's also, so you're not getting, like, FOMO, like, my friends are at the beach and they didn't invite me. Or, like, 
you know, my friends are all at dinner together. These, you know, how I, <laughs> you see shit and you're just like, oh, so you guys, you guys all just went to the fucking movies? Like, <laughs> that's not, I, I can think of no specific example of that. But you see people doing shit like, oh, you guys all got like a Comedy Central thing and you're all like, Whatever the thing is that you're not getting, that's what like social media focus. That's like what all comedians hate everyone doing better than them. So maybe it'll be like better if we like for our mental health, if we're like, hey, Instagram shows me videos of people on trampolines going really high. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Those are like, hey, you like dunk videos. Maybe you like people in the air. Like, I don't yeah. know. Whatever it is, I like the idea that it's changing directions. What's scary about Facebook, though, is it's it's still number one because it's the simplest to use. And so whenever I go on Facebook, it's like a, I don't even recognize so many of the people. I, I'm obviously I know a lot of the people. But when I log on, the when I start to scroll the first five to seven posts, I'm like, who are these people? Right. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know a lot of them really. And then I click on the names. I'm like, oh yeah, I friended them a couple of years ago and, or they friended me and I met them once here and there. It's like, what is this? And, uh, and it just seems like friends. a wasteland. You got to get rid of your friends. You got, or some of the people that you don't know. I will every now and then go to my friends on Facebook. It is just a fucking graveyard of people who used to do comedy. Oh yeah. It's pretty crazy. That is like, insane. Like who's been there since 07? Yeah, that's when Facebook became like public to everyone. I think it was 07. But that's like when college. you about when you started, like about a year yeah. or two in there, and then that's about yeah. So it's just a graveyard. Your friends, your Facebook friends, it's just it's you're gonna be waltzing, whistling past graves of like dead, like dead careers. No offense if you don't do comedy anymore. Thank yeah, you. dude. <laughs> I was there's always a couple names that pop up where you're like, what the fuck? There's a lot of funny people, a lot of great. I mean, some of the best comics quit. I was thinking about this. A lot of my favorite comedians, like 90% of my favorite comedians, like my favorite ones, are not famous. And of the famous ones, I don't I only like like 10% of those. The gatekeepers are bad. I yeah. I mean, as and someone Dan, who's not famous, I, I would think, agree with you. I think about your Danny Cowles quote all the time. I have better taste than uh, the, the Conan producer. So, yeah, like, yeah, everybody, every like everybody. Let me let the listeners know what that's in reference to. They, know I didn't want to. I didn't want to put his Danny's thing on blast if uh, if if it wasn't supposed to be out. No, I don't think he would care. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Danny Cowles, who produces comedians, you should know with me. This they won't know. I'm not saying who it's in reference to. But um, I don't even remember who's in reference. Someone who just done Conan or something like that didn't like their slot in our show or wanted more time or something like that. And then he said, I have better taste than whoever books Conan. Meaning like, yeah. I don't give a fuck that you've done that. This show is based off of what, not just him, we, it's a collective as a show. But I just, I love that he said that because that particular person at the time needed the reality check. And there are some people. And that's also the Conan producer is just a guy too. Yeah, and I've actually met that guy. He's a he's an awesome. He's dude. a great he's a nice he's guy. A, he's done my show. I mean, yeah, he's, yeah, great guy. But it, it wasn't about Conan. It wasn't about that guy in particular. It was in general. No. Like, I don't care that yeah. you did this thing. We could have been talking about doing Wendy Williams or some shit. Right. Um, he's which I get though. As a comic, you get a big credit though. You're hoping that's enough weight to get doors open for you. you. Do hope that. But there's also you. You still need to have some. You need to check the the toot a little bit, though. Yeah. There, there's some people I've seen really good comedians become mediocre comedians, but they still appear that they're doing well because they have they're part of the industry now. They get that push, and they don't grow and evolve because I feel like a lot of their friends are like, "Well, I can't tell them that their new joke sucks because if they get a show, I want to write on that show." And their agents and managers are going to pump their tires because that's their fucking job to make you feel like you're amazing. They're going to blow smoke up your ass all day. And so you're Stephen not really King, any... It's why Stephen King became Richard Bachman for a few years. He's like, am I really a good writer? Is everybody blowing smoke up my ass? I don't know this story. He went as Richard Bachman. He's like, I wrote this book. It's Richard Bachman. I'm, that's, who, that's my name. And he put it out and he'd be like, can it get published? He didn't know if he was actually good or if people were just like, Stephen King, Stephen King, Stephen King. 
And so that's what he did. And do they like the book? Yeah. He's, I mean, people are like, okay, well, yeah, we like it. And so I think that he, maybe I'm getting it wrong. But I mean, like Banksy submits shit to like big festivals and he gets turned down. And then they find out it's Banksy and he's like, ha ha, fuck you. You know? That's kind of cool. I like people using their power for things like that, you know? Yeah, because because a lot of, I mean, how much of it is you are getting things because of your name and how much is your actual talent? It's a good question. I mean, a lot of these comics, I think about you opening for Theo Vaughn and how you couldn't even get his name out. Theo Vaughn was a good comedian, but if he had come out as so another comic and that other, like, and they didn't know him. They're not screaming for him. So it is like he earned the credit, the like the fame. But I think that sometimes when you get to that level, at least from what I've heard them talk about, you kind of wonder like, am I am I good or do I just have fans? I mean, you have to be good to have fans, but like, could like, do, is this really that? Are they good? just gonna laugh at anything I say? Right. Yeah, I think yeah that, that you get a thing called imposter syndrome. So that's yeah. two things right there, right? There's some people who start to get famous and then they just think their shit doesn't stink, but it, their shit stinks. It stinks bad. I mean, but also, but I've seen like Jonah Hill go up at the Melrose Improv when he was going to be in um, Funny People and he got a standing ovation on the way to the stage and then he slowly fucking ate shit and like kind of sat back down. Yeah, no, that's that's in that documentary comedian. Colin Quinn says that comedy is like Jack the most humbling thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like whoever the most beloved guy could go up there. Everyone's like, oh, fuck yeah. And then it's like, all right, now you got to be funny. And so there's that side of it where I'm sure there people get huge and they're like, am I good? Or do these people just go crazy for me because I'm me and they like the thing I used to do? Yeah. And um, Theo Vaughn was crazy. And podcast fans in general, it's an interesting new thing that I wonder if someone's going to write a book about one day or really tackle the subject deeply. Um, when radio and especially podcasting, well, Podcasting is the new radio, but like you're in someone's ears. Yeah. So it's incredibly <clears throat> intimate in that setting. Yeah. And when you do a weekly or sometimes twice weekly podcast, that guy, I think Theo might go twice weekly. Um, you're, you know, people are listening to you in your voice for a couple hours a week. So they know everything about you. They feel like they're one of your buddies. They're like, they'd be, it's like a friendship form gets formed Yeah. and then they see you live. So they're all pumped up. And even if you stumble here or there, he's not. Really, Joe's not telling you not to. By the way, Joe's telling you that it's real and that we're friends. Oh no, it, yeah, it's real. And we're 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 really good friends. No, you sure. listening, we're friends. But he's anyone who's listening is my bestest. You guys are. We're all BFF. I'll he's, drive you to the airport. We're there for you. We're there for, for sure. You. Yeah. No, but we'll do. I so when I work with Theo and Theo was awesome. I had featured for Theo ten years ago before he was like he was just known as the guy who was on Road Rules. Yeah. And, and he was a nice, funny dude then. And, you know, he put the work in. I mean, to build a big podcast like that, you need to put the work in. But, of course, of course you need some breaks. Yeah. And you need to be smart strategically. Yeah. And he would be first to tell you, going on a big platform like Rogan's or a few of these other Tom Segarra's podcasts, it really helped catapult him, right? Um, you still have to have the goods, of course. Some people right. could get lucky and, and catch enough industry breaks. But to be – to have a that level of fandom – um, from a podcast, that's why I kind of like how podcasters go around the industry in a sense, you know, because we know people in the industry oh, who yeah. are okay. Um, they could they won't sell tickets because if they started a podcast, they have to go through a network and they were not going to get the fan. Anyway, let me finish the Theo Vaughn thought. Sorry, everyone, I kind of went awry from that. Um, is that so? Yeah, you got that intimacy level, they feel like they know him, they're like, we know his style, we know what like his cadence to his voice. So even if he's up there working on some new shit and it's kind of, he's kind of fumbling through it. The audience is kind of like, we know where he's going with it. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. you might get some pops there, but it was incredible. When I brought him on stage um, at, at the laugh factory, there's no backstage. So he's coming up like this side, uh, like aisle and they started to see him before I got to the second part. Cause he's like, he, I asked him like, Oh, what do you want me to say? He's like, I just mentioned these few things. I think he had a special coming out soon or about to come out. And, and I th said the second thing, and it just became deafening. It was still, I've never seen anything, I've never experienced anything like that in comedy since, as far as me being on stage, bringing someone else up and not being able to hear. Cause they, it was, they, they were like, we, they saw a Beatle. They just saw Paul McCartney. That was like their world. And then another dude I work with, um, I'm chewing your ear off here for a little bit, Brado, but then I want to ask you a, a question that I think you might dig. 
because I think the listeners are going to find it really fascinating. Um, I work with this dude, Shane Smith. Dude's all tatted up. He's got tattoos on his face. Um, he's got a podcast and a pretty big TikTok following. New York, comic in New York. I had never heard of him before I got booked to open for him. I found him to be really funny. Storyteller. Pretty much all his jokes were like long-form stories, and they're really funny. Punched him up real well in between. And his fans were bringing him gifts. Like he had a joke about like um, being terrible at karate or something like that when he was younger. And someone made a plaque like "Worst Karate Kid Ever" or something. Like they made him like a fake trophy and like, like, and it's just crazy how. And I've only really seen that from people who have fan bases through podcasts. I opened for Mark Marin back in 2011 when I was pretty in, young into comedy. I was opening for that, and he uh, his fans were bringing him baked goods. People like were making him food and giving him food. I remember being like this. This level of podcast fandom is different. Like Kevin Hart, his fans aren't bringing him food and making him presents. You know, um, I think this is the type of thing you get from the intimacy of being in someone's ear for several hours, you know, a yeah. month or a week in some cases. For sure, for sure. All right, here's the question for you, Brido. Okay. You have been in national commercials for Dunkin' Donuts. I have. Carfax. Yeah. Heineken. Yeah. What other ones am I missing? Oh man, I, I have a list because, uh, but Audi. Pepsi, I've been in like 30. I don't know. 30 national commercials. So I Nike. wanted to Nike. That's a big one. I wanted to ask you this. I was talking with some friends over the weekend and someone didn't know how that commercial work, especially a national commercial is it's a good chunk of change. So now that's your list. Cool, man. All right. He's showing on the phone. Everyone looks on audio. I'm not going to ask you exact money wise because that's private, but <clears throat> give people the idea of the pay structure in oh. um, commercial acting. Well, it's okay. I never really knew, but it has to do with the budget of the advertisement and what show it's on. So, like, if it's on the Super Bowl, that's the most amount of money that you will get. If it's on, have you done a Super Bowl commercial? No. Okay. Genie has. I know that. So, if if it's not union, if it's not in the Screen Actors Guild, you get something that's known as a buyout, where they say we are going to pay you a flat rate for this, and then that's what you get, and then maybe they'll do more, and you can negotiate from there, but. Because this is this this is the sad thing. Because I'm in SAG, and because I have a commercial agent, I trusted the union and my agent to fight for as much as I could get, and so I was pretty hands off about it. You can when you sign up for when you like join SAG, they will give you like a pay structure thing. They're always trying to negotiate for the best thing because they now they pay in fucking Applebee's coupons and shit. Like they like they don't want to pay any money they want you to do it for free but that's why the union exists so when people are like anti-union i'm like so i got it i get i still get checks from being on like ncis like for three dollars like every week or so i'll get a check for three dollars so you get a day rate for being there like you get like just a base pay you get paid for being wardrobe if you go over time, it goes it goes crazier. And then every time it plays, you get something. It's like um, every time your uh, your record plays on the radio, you get something like that sort of thing. So it's like sound exchange or any sort of pay for play type thing. The more it plays, the more you make, and the more it costs to be in the thing because of ratings, the more you get paid. So the best thing possible to be in is a big, like, ad that if it's if you're gonna be in one commercial, if you're not gonna be flow, the best thing to be in is to be in a Super Bowl commercial, and or one that plays during like the highest rated shows on network TV. If it plays late at night, like it's then you get. I mean, so you could make the standard used to be like thirty thousand dollars per commercial on average see that's what i think people were going to get a kick out of hearing thirty thousand per commercial per average you're saying right so you want it to for play national for a commercial everyone that's the big thing national because I've, I've done a few locals and it's it's nice money 
for the right. work, but it's not right. near national commercial money. Right. And it depends on if it's internet only. It can be internet only. It can be industrial only, which means that it's just for internal usage, like training. Yeah. Like there's stuff that only plays. I know a guy who once. did one for gas stations. Yeah. Like when you're filling your tank, sometimes the gas station has like little gas station TV. And see, that's the type of thing where it's like, yeah, you take that money, but it's like sometimes you show up and you're like, oh, it's fucking internet only. It's it's this, it's that. Or it's like I did one during COVID that was internet only. And like I had to sign a waiver because I didn't have a budget, but I was doing the director a favor, quote unquote, whereas like he's fucking doing me a favor. I hadn't made money like in a year. And so he he like threw me and it was Jordan Vote Roberts. He threw me and Brady like a bone. And so I was in a commercial with uh the spelling bee champion and <clears throat> what's her name? Uh I met the guy that drinks ocean spray on the skateboard. That was fun. Oh that dude? Yeah. Yeah. Um Dog base, I think his name is or something. Yeah. So one year one year I did a seven i did seven pepsid commercials it was a campaign and that like one of them was photos so it's like we were in people magazine like posed with like a thing i think that that day i was handed a check for six grand i because i think that photo stuff has specific rules voice i, I was on the radio for that like we did voiceover stuff that has specific rules and then we did like commercials on top of it. That paid for my fucking wedding. Like that was. Yeah, no, it's big money. I wanted listeners to get a kick out of that because I mean, I, think... I made six figures. That, I made six figures that year. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, there are people I've met people in L.A. and uh, New York even who they do shoot commercials here in Chicago, too. But they make good livings off the commercials. And obviously that that the well will run dry though. It's not consistent. You have one big year, you get one down year, but oh thankfully God, the yeah. residuals keep coming in. And so that's just another revenue stream. Now you mentioned Flo from Progressive. What do you think her what do you think she's worth? Well, she got a what's known as a suicide contract, which means you guys, my career is fucked if I keep doing these. So you have to pay me for the rest of my life. My life is over. That's what, that's what, see, people tell you, you hear shit all the time about, like, I heard this, but she got, she got like a huge, like millions of dollar buyout thing because that, that woman probably didn't want to be, she probably wanted to be on SNL. She probably wanted to be like a movie star, a sitcom star, but she became flow. I mean, you probably, I mean, I'd take it, but she, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I would too because flow. The progressive lady. Let's see if I could find out. Um, but the problem with celebrity net worth, everyone though, is it's always fake. It's always stupid. always wrong. Um, yeah, flow progressive actress. I have no idea. Let's see, like net worth. Yeah, salary. I'll just type in. <clears throat> uh, let's see. This is according to reports. Courtney, who plays Flow and Progressive, earns one million each year for her role. Only a few performers who appear in commercials got as much money as this. I think she's. Now, he Maybe one million per commercial. She did like ten commercials, and she gets the residuals. I bet. Yeah, she, I mean, the way that she's structured, she's doing fine. She's they made it so that she's not like, you know what? I want to be on this sitcom as like the sister. You know, should probably do okay there. But I know what you're saying there are some people who right. are, you know them from a thing, and then they're done. That's why it's called the suicide contract because yeah. it's like you just won't be taken seriously anymore after that. Now it's so funny. I was going to use the example that popped in my head. I'm like, let's think of someone. I was about to say like Jared from subway. He wasn't going to break into acting. He's not, he's not going to break out of prison. Hopefully bad guy. But like, you know, there's certain people where once you're attached to the brand, that's it. Unless so you can many, make yourself so many people we've mentioned on this, Michael Jackson, Louis CK, Jared from subway. Basically we have to kind of mistrust every celebrity. What is flow done? I guess we'll find out. Oh God! I hope Flo's fine. She's great. Um, I like. She's a woman. Flo. Uh, so far, the, those are all men. So we'll see. Flo. Uh, hopefully, we, we need some pervy strong. ladies out there. Just to. Where are you at, pervy ladies? Come on, they're probably smarter about not getting caught. Um, or hopefully, they <laughs> here's don't the, so. So here's what I will tell you: If you're thinking about getting into commercials, even a handsome man like yourself, 
you have to throw it that all away. You are okay. You have to be willing to not be attractive. And you're like, Brido, that's easy for you. You're gross. It's like, yeah. And guess what? I book all of those spots. I'm the best looking ugly guy you've ever talked to. You have to be you have to be willing to go, I'm gonna make this dumb face. I'm willing to be dumb. You have to throw your ego out. You have to be like, I will I will be shirtless in this commercial where the commercial is called terrible pale nipple boy like you have to be willing to do that so here's a quick rule of thumb to know if you are attractive because everybody i see their fucking headshots i see your headshots you not you but everybody everybody wants to look gorgeous in their headshots like leather jacket like maybe like i'm a i'm a detective i'm a leading man how many times per day and this applies to women also how many times per day are people constantly trying to fuck you? If you're a man, if the answer is not every day, then you cannot be on screen and have the audience think, I want to fuck him. You can play friend and then they'll later be like, friend is pretty hot, but you have to be willing to be actually that guy's like not bad look. Like, because what happens is, the, your job is to be funny, right? Your job is n- you are not going to be handsome, sweetie pie, handsome boy. You are going to you're going to you're going to be funny guy who's maybe dumb because it's a commercial and men are like, oh, what? And then like later on, if you'll meet, you'll be like, dumb guy is pretty good looking. But you have to be willing to be unattractive. That throws a lot of people off. It might sound crazy. But do you want to be on TV? Do you want passive income or not? I stand there with the competitor's product and I'll be like, and I make a dumb face and they, and it paid for my wedding and I don't regret doing it. But what I didn't do is fucking think like, oh, they, they, Hollywood thinks I'm ugly. Guess what? People aren't trying to fuck me. So I'm not going to be like gorgeous guy. No, nobody is trying to fuck me. Your wife is, I'm sure, on certain moods. <laughs> she tries to make love, not there loveless, you go. not loveless sex. Very, there you go. Um, yeah, people need to realize though. I was just thinking about like the Carfax commercial you did. Now, if everyone who went into that guy's office, because it's one of those commercials where there's different people coming in and being like, "Show me the Carfax," to this dude who does not want to show them the Carfax. Yeah, he doesn't. He's very much against. Showing them the car facts. Oh, car maps, he says. Yes. And got the car fox, all those gags, right? If everyone who was in that commercial was smoking hot, people would be like, what the fuck dealership is this where every customer is a smoke show? So, yeah, yeah, you need real people and have a real look. And those are the people who do very well. Now, obviously, there's some commercial campaigns where it's like, yeah, there's some smoke show or they get a celebrity attached. We're not talking about that world. That's a different world altogether. Uh, But, yeah, commercial acting. Is great money if you could get it, um, especially the national ones. Flo was smart to get that big paycheck because, again, it's, it was going to hurt her career el- elsewhere because people would just only see her as Flo. I saw an interview with Jason Alexander, who played George in Seinfeld, who did McDonald's commercials in the early 80s before he blew up as an actor and television shows. And he's a Broadway guy, too. He talked about their contract negotiations for Seinfeld going into season six, I want to say. Because they said, you got to pay us more. We know how much this show makes, all this. You have to pay us more. Because now that this show has become the mega hit that it is, I'm going to struggle to find work after this. I'm always going to be George. And yeah. that was his big fear. And so he they were, he was going to walk. And luckily, Jerry came in and said, no, pay him what he's worth. This is bullshit. Get it done. And Jerry was in a weird spot because he was like their friend and colleague. But he was also a producer. And the producer's job is to make a show as cheaply as possible, essentially. Um, but he he you know, he sided with the actors, of course, which was a good thing. I would have been very annoyed to hear otherwise. But yeah, it's interesting. I don't think people think of that with their careers sometimes. It's the choices you make could affect you later on down the road. But luckily with commercial acting and being a comedian, in your case, no one in the world would have been like, oh, I can't take you seriously as a stand-up. I saw you in a Dunkin' Donuts commercial. Well, a lot of bigger 
actors are people who are trying to get taken seriously as actors who were comics quit doing commercials. So they really could now. be yeah, so they could be taken seriously as actors. Like that was advice. I mean, I don't I would name you names, but I don't know if they want me putting that out, but there's people who did a ton of commercials and they're like, "No, I'm on I'm I'm doing the sitcom thing now and that makes me look cheaper." I guess like it's the it's the jizz mopper of acting. I mean, it is a lot of money, but like you know but how many people who have been in commercials that did them coming up. I feel like for sure. That, that's I love Bill Hicks' joke about advertising and marketing and commercials. Bill Hicks' thing was about like commercial acting is great for people who are on their way up or like on their way down. But he was ripping on Jay Leno because Jay Leno was doing Doritos commercials when it was well known that he was making like $8 million a year doing the tonight show. So his thing is like, do you need to have all the money? And there are times where I see big name celebrities like a Jennifer Aniston or someone doing commercials, unless it's her own company. Where it's like, here's my line of makeup that I get. But if you're just selling someone else's product, it's like you make $30 million a year. How much fucking money do you need where you have to shill for some company? It's weird. You know, it's you need strange. another house, you know, a sixth or eighth or seventh house. It's like, I don't know. I just, I lose a little respect there for some commercial acting in a sense. But again, if you're an up and coming actor or you're, um, you know, just a working at, yeah, do the commercial. John Goodman was in commercials for stuff before he did Roseanne and before he did all those movies he did in the late 80s, before, you know, like Raising Arizona. No, and stuff. Make, make the money. Make also, the money. also, work begets work. You don't know who saw you in the commercial and will want you for the other thing. The director is also trying to be a director. So you don't know. Also, you don't know who you're going to meet at the fucking, uh, like the audition. Those like actors, because producers start somewhere. I've booked things. I booked a pilot that from just another actor who I used to see it like fat guy auditions. I booked uh, two Audi commercials because the hair and makeup person on this Pepsi shoot recommended me to her boyfriend who was the director. Like it's all incestuous. It's like comedy. If you're like, man, should I go do this open mic? It's like, there's going to be three famous people to come out of that open mic too. Like that's just how, it is. If you pay attention to like your surroundings and you are and you are nice to people, everybody is also trying to come up. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. That's why I did, you know, like your little podcast here. No, <laughs> <laughs> Who knows who's listening right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's shift gears a little bit here. Um, great stuff, Brado. Thank you for uh taking uh, the listeners through the world of commercial acting. Now I uh, am a big sweets guy. I love sweets, you know? Sure. Uh, I think I like Little Debbie better than Hostess, but I go back and forth. Mm -hmm. I had a thing on Twitter where I've noticed that Little Debbie has been selling, they've been pushing the Cosmic Brownies more than their original brownie, and it's annoying to me. But then it made me think to myself, because I got into it with some people, what are the best, like, snack cakes type stuff? What are your favorites? Do you have, like, a favorite... Um, you could, could be hostess or little Debbie, but like, what is your go? If you're like at a convenience store, you know, you're getting something and you'd see that little shelf with all yeah. the, like, the yeah, dingers yeah. and the Twinkies and the cupcakes, the ho-hos, the ding-dongs, what makes you go, fuck, that's the one I'm grabbing right now. The first thing I thought of was the zebras. That's little Debbie. Zebra cakes are great. Okay. Zebra cakes. The second thing I thought of every now and then. I don't, and I haven't had one of these in years. I will get a craving, and I'll be like, "What? What is that that I want? Is that oatmeal cream pie?" Those are fantastic. Fucking that, love those. Those Underrated. are re really good. And then, dude, I used to get a box of those and keep them in my car. And then when <laughs> I was ever hungry, I'd reach into the box and pop one in because they're like a box for like two nineteen. They're so damn cheap. They're so good. Do you know what's really funny too and kind of sexual? So listeners who watch pornography, and I'm sure you've come across pornography on accident once or twice. Oh, cream pie. Great. Yes. There was this, you know, TikTok gets dirty. There was a trend or, you know, uh, it, it wasn't a trend. It was uh, the clip uh, trended. That's what I meant to say. Anyway. I know that's um, right. when you ejaculate inside of a woman, it's called. That's where cream pie is. When you ejaculate inside of a woman, but also she has to like push the ejaculate out. I'm looking sure like cream. There's nuance, I'm sure. Yeah. There's nuance. 
So there's this video where this woman who looks like a mother or something like that. I mean, she talking to a little kid, maybe she's like 38 years old or something. She's cute, but you can say MILF to me, Joe, if you'd like. Oh, she was, she was a MILF. All right. I didn't know. I didn't know if you dabbled, but, uh, she, uh, some little kid says, do you like cream pies? And she's like, do I like what? And she's like, do you, and then the, you hear the kids, but you don't see the kid, but you hear the kid's voice again going, do you like cream pies? And then she's like, yes, yes, I do. And she smiles at the camera, real sexually suggestive. And so many people, the big thing on TikTok is people lip sync to a sound. So many people started lip syncing to that sound where I was like, uh, I see what you're saying. And I get why it's funny. But it's still a little kid's voice, so it always made me just cringe a little bit. Like, yeah, I'm not okay with this. I'm I'm gonna say no, thank you, Jared from Subway. Yeah, <laughs> no, thank you, man in the mirror. Mm-mm, not into it. All right, oatmeal cream pies are a good one. Nutty bars I used to like as a kid, but as Whoa. an adult, not a fan. I'm a, I, you know who makes a nutty bar now is different. Like uh, Reese's makes them now, kind of like their own version of it. They're like crispy, like a kind of like a wafery type of deal. I'm going to try that because I love Reese's peanut butter cups. Oh, I, this is your, your new favorite thing. When I, I think it is weird when the, like when the original candy bar or the original soda pop start branching off into sub genres of their thing. It's like the Mountain Dew code redification of everything where Mountain Dew is like this red pop is Mountain Dew too. It's like, but it's not. Don't don't give me a spin-off series about like it's call it something else, you cowards. If you believe that's me. like the people who say don't call it a veggie burger. It's not a burger if it's not meat. Make no, up I'm your saying, own name for it. I'm saying don't tell me it's Mountain Dew. Don't be Richard Bachman. Don't hey call call it code red. Just go, it's called code red. Do you is it good? Don't, don't piss like, on my shoe and tell me it's raining. I hear yeah. you. Don't tell me this is Mountain Dew. <laughs> Sorry, I coughed and then I remembered what I wanted to do earlier. Uh, Brian said, I have a Brido and I have a good friend named Matt Dwyer who I know listens to this podcast. So, Matt, Brido, and I want to say we hope your testicles are feeling better. Um, <laughs> should I say why? I don't know if I should say why. No, 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 no. Just, just Matt, I hope your, your scrotum. Is having a better day today. To, you know, I just I wish you the best down there, pal. There you go. It's a little inside shout out. If you, the listeners, want to hit me up, I'll give your friends a weird shout out like that just to see if they really listen to the podcast. Now we'll know if Dwyer really listens. That's oh yeah, now he can't. Yeah, yeah, Dwyer. We won't tell him if he all if of a sudden hits me up, going like, "Dude, what the fuck?" Now we'll I hope, you're, I hope you're listening, and I hope both of them balls doing better. Hell yeah, man, dude! I've been doing this new thing. I don't know if people. So how like how did I do? How did I do in my little Debbie contest? Good man, you you named some good ones. Did you was zebra cakes your all time favorite? I think uh, now that I mention it, I think cream pie. Although I think that that's such a gross sex term. It is that gross. I that it, that it does affect me wanting to say that out loud to you. No, I don't like. Well, just say oatmeal cream pie. It's oatmeal cream pie. It's the full name. First of all, one of them came first. Like I don't know when I see like lipstick whoever invented lipstick had seen a dog's dick before like what do you why would you make it look exactly like a dog's dick why would you do that to me dogs came first why would you make your thing that you put on a woman's mouth exactly look like a dog's dick i don't think they're saying the oatmeal cream pie looks like a woman's vagina that's what they're literally saying i don't think they're saying it looks like a woman. I the think two things saying... in the white in the middle yeah i all right, fair point to that, but it's more. I always thought the somebody term went, cream somebody pie. probably went. It looks like a cream pie. That's exactly why it's called that. <sighs> oh right. yeah, that's I'm not probably grossed true. out. I'm grossed out by the term. I guess I, I'm grossed out. I by don't somebody... like the term either. No, I don't. I don't like the term either. Look, here's the th- here here's my feelings on this. I thought vagina is also called pie. I've heard people say, "Oh, that's a nice piece of pie." It is. And the cream okay, yeah. is the cum. So there's the cream pie. I didn't think it was this looks like an oatmeal cream pie if you turn it vertically, you know what I mean? Well, as I I I haven't really put this out there, but I came up with that term. And that's what I was thinking. It was you. It was me. It was always you, Brido. It was, it was always you. I mean, I coined it. And uh, that's what I that's what I had in mind. Turn it you sideways. coined two phrases. You coined "bang your pregnant," "bang your pregnant," "cream pie," and that's how you get pregnant. That's "bang" how you get pregnant. 
except for if when it squeezes you gotta wait to squeeze it out dude i don't like yeah i don't i don't like porns with cream pie because no. the camera focuses in and it's just her no. ugh, pushing it out i don't fucking need to see that no. it's not hot there's a lot of things i don't want to see in porn yeah, dude, I was watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He had he was talking about Max character was talking about how Dennis would film himself with women. He goes, "Oh, it's terrible. It's always that angle that you see in porn where it's like behind the guy's ass where you just see balls going in. And it's like he's doing this thing, and it's so funny." And I'm like, "Dude, he's right. That is the worst angle. Who thinks that's good? Nobody wants to see the back of the guy's asshole and the back of his balls. As it, it's just well, terrible. Like the director. Maybe like women it. like that angle." Because it shows I like the, doubt it, doubt it though. I doubt it. I don't think they like that angle. I'm just trying to think who's that angle for. Who is that angle for? It's you know what angle I also hate in baseball the behind the catcher. Sometimes they'll show the camera angle from behind. You see behind the umpire, and behind the catcher, and I hate it because I can't tell if the pitch is a strike from behind the umpire's ass. That is the dude's butthole and balls porn shot of baseball shots. Right. And baseball and porn are two things that are very important to the fabric of America and they're doing a disservice to us. Yeah. I think that you nailed it. I think that it's like, show me the strike zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the strike. I used to have a joke where I talked about um, accidentally coming inside and then I would say, ooh, I got a little wild in the strike zone. <laughs> Oh, that was hope a good those, bit. I should bring that back. Hope, hope those balls are doing good. Mm. Did I? I wonder if I. Thank you. <laughs> they actually are doing terrible. They were. I wore. Have you ever worn underwear where you're like, this is way too tight, but it's the only pair of underwear I've clean, and you <laughs> suffer through the day. I do have only pair of clean type of underwear, and it's the old boxers, the old boxers, like the 1999 boxers with like the pattern on them that you would wear. Not oh, you, God. but but like the. Now all boxer briefs, but I was going to show you a pair because I can see where the the dresser is from here. But the uh, the sag your pants kind of pattern on them. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I finally threw away my uh, boxers with the like holes in them because I'm yeah. like, yeah, I'm an adult. I don't need holy boxers. I threw them away. But I kept these. They're Reebok and they're like the type of boxers that like a model would wear. They're like the boxer briefs. They're very form fitting. My 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 ass. It's, it's America's ass. We, in that want that, we want that shot, that behind you shot. Well, if I'm walking, if, if I was walking, um, if, I, if it was, that was that scene that you see in movies and TV shows when it's like, the, it's, say it's a female, say it's an Amy Schumer movie and I'm the random dude she bangs after being at a bar and I get up and walk to the bathroom and she kind of looks at my ass. She'd be like, all right. Like that's how my butt looks. Keeps it right in there. These underwear. Keeps it, okay. Yeah. Keeps the cheeks in place. Right. And looking firm. But it kills my balls. It's so tight that I really only wear it for an emergency. And I keep telling myself I'm going to lose enough weight so they're not so tight. But I can't. I I warmed to drop my sons off at school today. And as soon as I came home, both times, I stripped and just walked around the house naked. Because I'm like, I need to let these suckers breathe um, to make up for the tightness they, they just felt. Huh. Yeah, I don't well, know what to go. do about that. I don't know what type of... Well, I'm just saying, I'm, you clearly are a smart man who's never bought underwear that was too tight because this was a mistake on my end. I mean, yeah, I, I guess I'm doing good down there. You know. are. It's a European style underwear, and I think they had European sizes because I thought I was buying large. Here, here's the thing about Europeans, though. I mean, I've met Europeans who are very tall, but they're very skinny. Yeah. And I think they like their clothing tight. And they do, I hear, yeah. It's like, look, I've got. Oh, man, American we had a, we had, we had a foreign exchange student in high school. And when he changed in the locker room, he was the only one wearing like fucking bikini briefs where it was just like, are you like a, a stripper <laughs> <laughs> with like a, like orange, like it's like the bangles helmet. Oh God. Yeah. European men on beaches, they're rocking that speedo. They're keeping yeah. that going. It's such a terrible look. I don't understand that. Like peener straight up, it, like right. Yeah, it makes your dick look like it has a tiny boner all the time, or if or it's up too much and then it's bunched up. Yeah, right. You ever see those guys where they're wearing a speedo where you're like, he's got a little boner going, or is it just yeah, making it, it poke there. a little? It just sits. Is it, is it limp and poked out? I don't know. It's yeah, a it's mystery got a, down it's there. Just sitting, it's just sitting up. Do yeah. women have that if their underwear is too tight? They're like, this is brutal, but not really. I think they have their bras, but the bras are too tight. 
makes their their boobs that's why they have to free them when they get home from a long day of work makes sense so yeah. you did that but with your balls yeah i you did bought european nut braziers and you're looking for some support mm -hmm. you know we we're talking about porno earlier uh, i do like it when um <clears throat> they call it the drop when women are with really big ones they're taking off their bra or shirt you know and as they're lifting the shirt up the boobs are coming up with it and at the last second the boobs just drop out so it's like boom you that's know a fun, that's a fun fun yeah that's a fun thing i clap every time i see it i cheer sure when my wife does at home i go yay woohoo boobies i think boobs are making a comeback this decade I will, it, it, the last 10 years was all yeah. about the app. I think this next 10 years is all about the boobs. That's interesting. You know what I'm going to say? Like, I'm going to throw in a dark horse. Legs. Legs coming back? You know, you know what? No legs one is talking about legs. Oh, the 80s. She's got 80s. legs. That's, dude, I was going to say that. She's got legs? When's the last time you heard like the 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 stems on her? Like The gams? I was watching this documentary about Princess Diana. No one, if you like... She had a hatchback, and everywhere she goes, you know, she gets laughed at. Like she was just no, no butt on that, no butt on that. Just a inbred royal behind. Couldn't do that today. She couldn't walk around today like that. No, and you no know, one would butt, accept it. The butt stuff. <laughs> yeah, if you're gonna be a princess, let's 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 see that rump formed a little bit. You know. Yeah. What are you, what are you trying to pull here? Well, squats are so big now. Squats like, are big. I, Everyone's got a butt. I was talking about this recently where in my head, I'm like, I think women are getting hotter again. Well, I mean, people, human beings in general get hotter every year though. I feel like, well, we evolve. It's like, I don't like comparing athletes of different eras because it's not fair. Technology gets better. You know, there's been, there was football, like Gail Sayers was one of the best running backs of his era. His knee injury, if he had that today, he'd be back three weeks later because medical advancements and stuff like that, you know? And I look at that with human beings right now. Like I know the importance of drinking water every day. You think some dudes in the fifties knew that shit? No. no. So what, that's why. And also they're in smoke filled rooms. Yeah. We look at pictures of rock stars from like Jim Croce died when he was 30. If I showed you a picture of him when he was 29, you would have thought yeah, he was have. 56. You have. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy how bad people age. Cause they're in smoke filled rooms. They didn't know yeah. any better. They weren't eating well. They weren't drinking well. The moisturizer, pff, get the fuck out of here. They weren't using any of that kind of stuff. So I don't like comparing the eras there. Um, it's, it's interesting though. Cause with the, with legs, you went right to the decade I was thinking of. Yeah. Legs, the buns became bigger toward the Sir Mix Lot. Aerobics were huge in the 80s. Sir, Sir Mix Lot. He kind of got it going a now little bit. Buns of Steel. Buns of Steel. That's what's going to go. The aerobics of Buns of Steel came out late 80s, early 90s. Then the Sir Mix a Lot song. But the then, butts still didn't own the 90s. Boobs no, owned the 90s. Jennifer Lopez. That was early 2000s. So I would say or that Kardashian. the legs were 80s because I remember everyone with legs. I remember being a little boy. My mom worked at a restaurant called Wags and I was sitting on one of her friend's laps. I was like four or five and I was rubbing her leg because she had black nylons on. And I was like, I like this. And then I think she was like, all right, you got to stop, little boy. You don't rub a woman's legs. Uh, she was probably into it. You know what I mean? But <laughs> that's Thank creepy you. in a lot of levels. Uh, but yeah, legs were all the black nylons, very thigh high stockings. People, that was a big look in the eighties. Panty hose, panty motherfucking hose. You said it, Brido. So I think boobs with Baywatch because the slow motion run on the beach was huge in the nineties. I think Baywatch was a big part of that. The ass came in in the two thousands and it's kind of run even bigger now. Um, you know, and I think, but I think boobs are coming back. I think it goes in a cycle now where between boobs and ass. I don't know if legs will ever quite come back the way it did. Um, the face will always be there too. Don't worry. I have a pretty face. Also, you know what's really nice? A personality. I think a personality. No, a but it is, though. but it is interesting that I think the ideal man has pretty much say the same V-shaped torso. No one's ever like calves this, this decade or something. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. Just, it's the V-shaped torso is big. Women love that. And then, like the European hog. Yeah. <laughs> the, the European uh, cut uh, underwear with the struggle, struggling balls and the straight-out hog. Yeah, circumcised though, I believe that's still preferred. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm, messed, I'm making a generalization, but with, I don't know. I thought bulkier dudes were kind of big in like uh, the '80s. 
like hunky uh, guys. Okay, the, yeah. Hogan. Muscle dudes have their time. Yeah, but muscle dudes. I mean, Schwarzenegger, I guess, yeah, bodybuilding became like a more of a thing. But it's lean muscle versus bulky guys, right? It kind of well, shifts I think a little because, bit. I think the Brad steroids Pink, came out. See, steroids came out in Schwarzenegger, and I think dudes were like, holy shit. But then, like, women were kind of like, eh, I actually like the lean, the lean guy. Yeah. And then um, I think then dudes were like, I want to look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club if possible. I think people always want to look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club. That's what um, a friend of mine said that uh, they're tr- they're like, well, so what type of look are you going for like in the gym? Like when the trainer asked him, and he said that like ninety nine percent of dudes say Brad Pitt in Fight Club. Tom Hardy yeah, and yeah. Warrior, I'd go for that. Tom Hardy and Warrior, yeah. It depends what you, you would look good with that build. I would like Brad Pitt in Fight Club. I feel like my shoulders are a little too broad, so I have Ooh. to find like I, I'm thinking more Ryan Reynolds in okay. several okay. movies. Because yeah. I think we're about the same height, me and Ryan Reynolds. Maybe he's a little taller. But I can't that movie, tell. But that movie came out like that's when boobs were still big. Now butts. Like, so like dudes kind of say the same. Whereas like, think about all of the fake boobs and stuff that I don't even know. if you Do you see women with like joke boobs like you used to like in the 80s? No, like, you don't. Like practical joke ass boobs. But now Dude. you see but you see practical joke ass butts now yeah and no, so I've, I've I, had... I, so i think it goes in like we're going like in the big boob extreme with like butts i think you're right man i mean this one um comedian i, I won't name her because <clears throat> i don't want to name the other person but we were talking about someone we knew and that i only met like once or twice but i'd seen a lot of her posts and we're, i was just like what's going on with her is her life just just vacation year round what's her story all this stuff so i was getting some information and then it was she mentioned that it was a fake butt and i'm like how the fuck do you know and she's like you can't tell i'm like no i literally can't i could spot fake boobs from a mile away but i can't out we were taught out with the 90s maybe if i really if i saw her butt clear as day but like i'm just seeing it in a picture so i can't tell a fake butt in a picture you know never trust a big butt to smile that girl is poison (laughs) You know what I thought of the other day when someone said thick thighs save lives? Whose? Whose life have thick thighs ever saved? One time I want to hear about a thick thigh saving a life. Did someone grab onto it? Barry Maybe Sanders. if Rose and Titanic had thick thighs, he could have grabbed onto those and he wouldn't be dead, Dawson, Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> she did, though, didn't she? I think she did have thick thighs. Actually, for yeah. back in the day, she was very and he voluptuous. Died. And he died, yeah. Underrated word, by the way. Voluptuous? Yeah. I like that. <clears throat> I think... Um... Big, big, uh, big, fat, heavy set women are going to come back. Like in the 1800s, that was like the big thing. Rubenesque. But with the corsets, though, are they going to do that? I hope sure. not. Wasn't I, there like I, a period I, where like heavy set women were considered like the thing? That was a bit. That was a, there was a time, you're right, where heavy set women were getting banged by dudes who wore wigs. So we could go to that. Like we could all have wigs and be like feeding our wives to be like, come on, gotta get with the times. The 1790s were the original gay 90s, I believe it was said. Like not, all the men but were happy gay, powdered makeup and happy stuff. gay, not gay. Happy gay, yeah. Yeah, that's to- to- totally totally what I meant. I was, so... I was saying it as homophobic. What am I 12? I wasn't saying it like that. Um, weren't you that I, your thing? Like we should bring back come everybody gay. It was like. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> this you know what, this so, conversation is so heteronormative. I was and... talking about this with a few comedians about how a well-timed gay could still be funny if the setting is right and the context is right. And I had gay comedians were part of the conversation. So it wasn't just a bunch of fucking do- dopey white guys like me talking about this shit. And we were talking about, well, Danny Kels, bring him up. He's got this great bit he used to do where i'm gonna butcher it but part of the joke was he goes because i don't own a printer why don't i why don't i own a printer because i ain't gay (laughs) and then he does a whole thing where it's like you know these gay guys always print and shit and it's ridiculous it's absurd because that's that's not a stereotype there's no stereotype of gay men being known for owning printers and constantly printing things that's why it's like funny you know and don't 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 kinko's shame don't kinko shit. There you go. And 
And then I thought about, um, God damn it. There was an episode of the show scrubs where the one son said to Dr. Kelso was like the old doctor. Like, Oh uh, yes. Yes. You showed me this. I showed you this clip. It's so funny. It's insanity. I got it. I got it. I would love to play it on the podcast. Maybe I'll share if you guys in the, I'll post share the YouTube link on the, I'll tweet it out or something, but it really is so funny because the little kid, he's like four and he says like, your skin's wrinkly and ugly. And then this old man leans down with a big smile on his face. He goes, Oh yeah. Well, that shirt is gay. <laughs> just and it's away. just like a blackout. And then it's just like done. Yeah. One hit joke came out in 2007 or something like, like that. I'm like, oh, that would not fly today. Got him. It's, I think that the reason that it was kind of fun or look back at more fondly than cringy is it never meant, it never meant never. homosexual when most people said it. When most people said it. If you called something gay, it the problem is, yes, you're using, you're using a, the underlying thing is homosexuality is bad, but it never, it meant, it meant something entirely different. And so it, I, I don't know. There was something a little bit more innocent about it to me. That being said, yes, I understand why people wouldn't want that uh, as a, as a saying, I guess. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I agree 100%. And that's how I felt. Like I felt like the people who would use it to hurt gay people wouldn't use the word gay, they would use the other word, the no, F they, word. Yeah. And that was their word. But like, I remember in high school once, this was before people started to end like the stop saying the word. This was like, you know. Kobe's on TV being like, don't say gay. Yeah. So this was, when I was in high school, people still freely said it and nobody was really campaigning to be like, stop saying it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, people were kind of late to that. But I remember one time driving with a friend of mine and um I was in the back. So you know how high school is. You got you cram like four or five people into a car, and the one dude some said something like, oh, "This car is gay" because it wasn't like starting right away. And then my one friend says, "What does that mean? Your car likes other cars, you know? Like, what is a gay car, you know?" And but he's like, "Well, you know, I didn't mean it like it's a homosexual car. I just meant it's not working." And I remember that conversation happening in two thousand one, two thousand two, in the back seat of a car. And so people were never using it. Not obviously, there were people out there who were because I'm I'm sure I'm gonna have some gay friends being like. People use it to me like an asshole. Yes, of course that existed. But a lot of people I know just used it for, you know, words change meanings a lot. Gay used to mean happy. Then it meant you were a homosexual person. Then but also made, dudes made, everybody. um, dudes thought straight dudes or whatever, high school kids, when nobody was out of the closet or whatever, made so many more gay jokes than they do now too. Like, haha, wouldn't it be funny if like, like, Dudes, didn't dudes make more like homoerotic type jokes back then? Don't you feel like? Because the because the underlying thing was like, haha, none of us are gay, right, fellows? Yeah, yeah, that's part of it. It was, like, dudes it was always like, how gay much voices. Or think about this: Would you suck someone's dick for a million dollars? That was so that common. Was People would be so like, common for high school yeah. dudes to do. Be, and then oh, you get older gross. and you're like. <laughs> I remember this one too. Someone's like, <laughs> yeah. would you let someone suck your dick for like a million? You wouldn't do the dick sucking. They would suck yours. Man, you're making me remember specific conversations. This dude I remember like, specifically. This kid um, is like, I'd suck Michael Jordan's dick. It's the one person people. Like, it was okay. always the one guy that someone would be like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, you know. Um, yeah. But then I remember someone, <laughs> my one friend, someone said like $10 million. Would you let a guy blow you? And he was like, yeah. And then I was like, oh, you're fucking gay. And then later everyone was like. Actually, I'd probably do it for a million. I'm not doing it, any work. I could was, close my eyes and think of something else. You know what I mean? That's why everyone shifted as they got older. The older you get, the more you realize how much money money is, you know? But also, but when you're in high school, it's never you're that you know that situation's never gonna happen. Never. And so you can be like, No, I wouldn't because it's gross and I'm not gay. And then you would have to take shit from a million dollars because I'm awesome. You know, I won't need a million. That's gonna be chunk. I'll wet my ass with a million, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, and it's like, I I just think that like you're you're in high school, you are kind of like at this point in time, like the late '90s, early 2000s. It's gay was something you could just become. Still, like that was like a thought that people had. No oh one God, really, yeah. People thought they you know, could just like wake up one day. And, yeah, people thought you could like 
then I realized I was gay or something. So it was like, and gay There's was still people who are stupid enough to think that though. Of I course. hear it all the time. They're like, Oh, they're grooming. I'm like, what do you mean grooming? They're exposing children. And the new Buzz Lightyear movie, the one character has a, as a lesbian characters, little kids don't need to see lesbian. I'm like, you think that's how they're going to become lesbians? Like, Oh, Oh, I didn't know that was an option. I'm six. Now I'm going to, I'm going to choose some box when I'm 14. And you know what I mean? Like so dumb. You don't even get what sex is at that age. Like yeah, you wouldn't see two people in a meet. It's just a lot of people don't want to explain things to their kids and they're dumb. Like yeah, it was, you yeah, have to be dumb yeah. because if my son said, Oh, two women can marry. I'm like, yeah, if women, two women love each other, they can marry. And that would be the end of the fucking sentence. And that I the never, I don't think I've ever met a person who is homophobic, like legit who didn't come out later. Really? Like, I really don't. I think that the most people who were the most vocal of it, I think dudes made jokes. Like, that was kind of, I mean, what else? You don't have any life experience. So it's not like you're going to make nuanced jokes about, like, the state of the world. You're a fucking idiot. And all you have yeah. is a, a boner and some snot in your nose. And so you're like, wouldn't it be funny if, like, my friend Joe? And then you're like, who hey, Joe? Like, Remember me and you were fucking, and then like that's the joke because you're an idiot. And then, but everybody who is actually homophobic, I think, kind of, what didn't they kind of come out later? I don't know Did anyone. No, but I mean, I don't know anyone personally. There's been famous people who obviously have come out years later because, yeah, like senators and congressmen who were all these anti gay bills, and later they get caught sucking off dudes at a truck stop. Yeah, that's a very common thing. It's a lot of these dudes out there who make these homophobic jokes because they're suppressing shit. And especially people who grew up in like the 90s and stuff, 80s, 90s, where the idea was when you make fun of someone, like this guy's gay because that was like a bad thing to be because it was you're not in the norm and your dad probably is sad. Because I remember people would be like, man, imagine having a gay son. Wouldn't that be the worst? Because everyone had this idea that like your son is supposed to be an extension of you. So if your son's gay, where did you go wrong? Maybe you're gay. Like, have you, know, you seen Slapshot in the, in the in the recent past? Oh man, I haven't seen that he, in like, a long his, time. His uh, his girlfriend. But I know it's a funny movie. Up, his girlfriend ends up being a lesbian, and he's worried that makes him gay. Yeah, this shit that this shit that doesn't even. <laughs> There's like a deleted scene in Back to the Future that they thankfully that they cut where Marty's like. If I kiss my mom, does that mean I'm gay? And like, that was the, like, it's just, it was just like a different, and that's one of the things where it's like comedy is better now because it's just like, that's, that's such a, like your shirt's gay. It's such a dumbass bit. Like, I know that's yeah. Like there's your shirt, like other shirts. That's like with the, my friend when he's called his car gay, but I, real quick, I agree with you that comedy is better because it's more aware and how stupid that line of humor is. I thought, now I got to watch Slapshot again, but wasn't it the real dumb character who says if his wife's a lesbian, does that make him gay? I thought they were making fun of that type of thinking. Doesn't Paul Newman say it? No, it's the one guy that's really fucking creepy. Remember the scene? I know a woman sure. wrote that movie. A woman wrote that movie, so maybe there is. Maybe I haven't. I maybe I. I think she's making fun movie. of that type of guy because that same uh, okay. guy. There's a scene when Paul Newman's on the payphone. And the one in Paul, and he's like, "Hey, we're gonna go to this place. The girls got tits up to here, and he's doing all that creepy shit." Um, you know, he's the one guy. You know, the guy's always sticking out his tongue. <sighs> there's the just, I can't like, see that There's so a long many time. like, there's so many weird sexual shit in movies, and that in comedies, like if you watch Mash, that's a fucking creepy movie. Or if you watch the movie that came up before the show, if you watch sure, yeah. um, uh, Porky's, which is a ripoff of mash it's all just like super creepy shit but yeah you used to just be able to be like that shit is gay and it's so the, part of the funny part about that is that it was shorthand for like a dumb character or like saying something was gay <laughs> it's just like it's dumb as fuck but sometimes dumb as fuck is funny and yes but the thing is it was you would kind of the understanding whereas you didn't do it in front of anybody who might have their feelings hurt by it you know what i mean oh, and so yeah, definitely and so definitely should go away but that's why it was funny because you were like if you were if your buddies were like good people 
the joke was, wouldn't it be funny if I had said this was gay? Like people do, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw someone tweet today and th there it was a serious tweet. It was from like an educator and she tweeted about like how these kids are in school for seven hours a day now. And if you can't teach all your lesson and get your syllabus across, she, this educator was basically advocating for no homework. Like the kids are in school for seven, eight hours, get it done there when yeah. they're at home, let them be kids, let them connect with their family, let them enjoy their free time, you know? And when we come to think of it, that's kind of true. Like it's almost like a work day and then they have to take their work home. So I was going to quote tweet it by being like, fuck yeah, homework's gay. <laughs> but then I was like, no, don't, I can't. That's something you could say in person and get a laugh. Right. But if I would have tweeted that people would have been like, Joe, this is a horrible thing to tweet. See, I'm man enough to admit that I had the thought. I didn't do the thought, but I also realized, yeah, that's a bad thought. And maybe I shouldn't put that I out there. Oh, I no. think that I think that we're not there yet. I yeah, think no, that, not as a society. I know we're not. Yeah. That's why I didn't do it. But I think I'm that, like still, you're that you're there and you know that, I'm there. Like, and yeah. I'm also there enough with my friends who are gay where I felt like I could have said that joke to them hanging out. Yes. You know what I mean? And they yeah. would have laughed most likely. See, the, um, now I'm I'm acting like the the white person who doesn't want to like laugh at the thing, but it's like if if that if I saw like plus the gay people make that joke, like I've I've seen it, so I know in some situations it must be but I, I just don't want to like I, I have that thing in me right now. It's like I don't want to laugh at the thing that I that I like would make somebody feel bad if I laughed at. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, totally. I don't know. Totally. No, I get it. I, um, I have. I we've been talking a lot about what you can and cannot laugh at lately. I still go back to laugh at whatever the fuck you want, and then always say sorry later. Um, if you're legitly sorry. I mean, now like I'm not saying as a comedian. I'm talking about as a human being. As a human being, you could find things funny. And then be like, all right, yeah, now that I've taken a step back, well, I can I, understand why people are upset. But in the moment, I laughed. And that's an okay, natural human response. Laughter is one of those things that it's, it's instinctual. Yeah, yeah. You see someone fall and you laugh sometimes, right? Yeah. Depends how bad the fall is, of course. If you laugh when someone's like cut their head open, you're a piece of shit. But you know what I'm saying? That's funny. That's the exact example. So I had this pr a professor, I had this scientist on my show. And he has narrowed down humor is it's a benign violation. So it means if you fall, the violation is you're supposed to not fall. You're supposed to walk. But it's benign because if a person like Charlie Chaplin slips on a banana peel, stands up, scratches his head, you laugh because he fell, but he's okay. So in a lot of ways, people get mad about comedy because your laughter means it's okay. And someone's like, it's not okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's okay for you. It's not okay for or something like if you laugh at if somebody gets hurt and you laugh at them. Now it's like you are saying that their pain and suffering is okay, and now you are like that's crazy, you know. No, that's a great point, and it makes me think to myself. It's another problem with our advancement. Not every advancement of technology is good because think about it: when people get really mad when they see a comedy clip go viral where it's like so-and-so said something and the whole audience laughed. You know, people always forget to bring that point up. Sometimes people will say, oh, yeah, that happened in Chappelle or the Daniel Tosh thing years back. Yeah. The whole audience laughed their ass off. And it's like, well, yes, you're seeing a 35-second clip here. You're not seeing the whole evening. That's also inside a comedy club, context is being built. There's an environment being built that lets everyone know these aren't out to hurt people. These are jokes. So when you're watching that clip on a Monday morning at 9.30 a.m. at your shitty job that you can't stand in your fucking cubicle drinking bad coffee, you're seeing it through the scope of, oh, these people think it's okay to, no, that's not, it's again, the, the set, you weren't in the setting. And that's why I hate whenever I see a leaked, clearly it's like someone's camera phone shooting a stand-up comedy clip yeah. video and that clip's going everywhere. Yeah. I, I right away, I'm like, I'm not gonna have a fucking opinion on this. I don't want to encourage this kind of shit. I don't like, I don't like the idea because you're almost breaking that bond that's between audience and performer there. It's a live fucking show. So if the audience no. is laughing, I don't think they're all a bunch of people out there being like, yeah, fuck these people. I, I, I agree with you. No, it's like they laugh because there was a, the environment was built and whatever 
there's shit came before it is my point too. Most of the time when people talk about st- comedy specials and they're the most angry about it, you, I've noticed that they didn't watch the thing or they'll be mad about yeah. it's, it's kind of strange to me. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but it's always like, did you watch it though? And it's like, no, I don't need to watch it. And they're and like, it goes, and they're like, Han- a lot of people didn't watch the Hannah Gatsby special that they should have on anyway. And yeah. a lot of people didn't watch um Chappelle. I-, I know there's no way a lot of people watched the Chappelle one because I was like, wait, you hated the last four. Why would you watch the fifth one? You know what I mean? Right. Um, you so- just heard he said a thing and you're like, well, I don't like when people say that thing. So I'm going to jump on it too. And the same goes with the other dudes. There's this weird, there's, there is like a thing with stamp comedy right now. That's very fucking annoying because it's the people fighting about free speech when it's like free speech is fine. It's not being threatened. And you guys are just coming off like very insecure. You know what I mean? You're coming off with people who want to fight to, for, I don't know what you're fighting for because you're fine. Right. Then there are people who are not realizing that the annoying part of comedy right now is you bring up a topic and the audience immediately is like, they, they get their assholes tighten up and it's like, well, yeah. you, I didn't even say anything yet. You got to at least listen. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> what we want us to do. Everyone needs to fucking listen. And then from listening, you could, that's why I said earlier with, if you're in an audience and you laugh at something and then later people are like, oh, it's not cool. You laughed at that. Then you could assess, but don't apologize. Like fucking, if it's funny, laugh, don't fight your urge to laugh about shit. I hate it when um, there's this kid that I that YouTube shows me his videos all the time, and the reason I started the reason I watched him in the first place is because he was breaking down the Brendan Schaub Gringo Poppy special, which was fascinating to me because this kid. But there's some jokes that they, like I noticed that like he's like this hold up real quick, yeah. real quick. I worked with Brendan Schaub a couple nights ago. Did you? Awesome human being. Okay. So I didn't, I don't know where you were gonna go never, with this. People were saying, I just want to let you know that I like the dude a lot. So I don't really want anything bad about him on my, I don't know. He was a great guy to work with a couple nights ago. This kid was shitting on his special. Okay. That's fair. And people are allowed their opinions. And I had heard other people say things about this special. So I decided to watch this guy's review of it. YouTube showed me, maybe you want to watch this. So I got annoyed with the kid because a couple of reasons, like, this doesn't really have anything to do with Brendan P.S. This is just more of like a, uh, if you're going to say something isn't funny, just like factually, don't show me a clip where the audience laughs. Because they vote, they, they're they outvoting you. They are outvoting you. Great call. Great they, fucking that's, call. They voted and it's funny. It was funny in the room, which is all that fucking matters. That is it. I mean, you at home are doing one thing, but you're not as invested. You know what it's like to go to a movie theater and or, or what it's like to watch it at home when you are fucking ironing or putting laundry away. Like if you're like at like you said at work, like I like you said you worked with you worked with this dude, like so you're more invested in it. You were there, right? So this guy so there's also some jokes that this dude just didn't get. And it's like I'm not saying it's I'm not here to defend him or to say that it's anything i just know that the kid was like this joke doesn't even make any sense and it's just like i could intellectually break down for you what the joke means like why are you why do you have a show if you don't understand what jokes mean like i i i could be like that joke sucks but here's what it means like it's so i just i it's a big pet peeve of mine when somebody is like that's not even funny it's like you you hear them laughing, don't you? Yeah, I think <laughs> it all comes back to that. You're right, man. They they out like when someone says, "Who's this for?" What's it? I'm like, "There's an audience for it." Clearly, like with music, you know, I mentioned that Olivia R- Rodrigo earlier. Look, with the the clip I saw her singing did not sound great to me. I've heard her on the radio; it sounds good. Could be auto tune. Who knows? But it doesn't matter. Her right. music is not aimed at me. It's aimed at the teenage girls who are screaming their heads off in the audience who are having a blast. It's, it's like a change. That's what matters. Channel. Change the channel if you don't like her. Exactly. You don't have this to watch is... Brendan Schaub's Gringo Poppy clips. If yeah, you if you don't like it. Yeah, you, people have to understand that certain things are just not for everyone. You know, and that's the one thing that critics have always annoyed me about a little bit with movies and stuff. And the good critics are fair enough to be like, look, it's a kid's movie. If you're into this, you'll like this. 
I'm not into this, so I don't like this, which is fair. I mean, you have a job to do. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. I get that. I just wish people would have a little more nuance with it. You know, I was talking about empathy earlier. I've been doing a thing, Mike. The last, have I done it the last two episodes? Yeah, two episodes ago, I had Kristen Toomey on. And then last week, I went solo. But I ended both of them with inspirational quotes I came across. I thought it'd be a nice thing to get a little more positivity going out there. And why like not it. start with my podcast? I like it. Man in the mirror. All right. Here's the quote. You're starting you're, with the man. You're starting with the man in the mirror. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. You're right. Absolutely. I'm asking him to uh, change his ways. Um, and no message could have been. I can't sing either. I'm like Olivia Rodrigo. Oh, uh, come on, Joe. All right. Here's the quote. It's uh, we should be lifting each other up and cheering one another on, not trying to outshine or one up each other. The sky would be awfully dark with only one star. Adolf I Hitler. like that. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't you can't cancel me who said that that's the fucking comedian in us it's like oh that's nice and sweet how do i make fun of that um it is I'm it so reminded me of you we, that was we, like... you. What, right we all talked about our, our hate relationship with twitter i was gonna say love hate it's not even love anymore our hate relationship with the twitter app and you talking about i remember a few years ago you saying you know what all people do is tear people down and say i hate this i hate that I'm going to use my tweets to tell people, hey, I like uh, my buddy Brooks Whelan just put out an album. Go check it out. Um, uh, my friend uh, River Butcher has a new show. Go check that out. Like all this stuff like that you could be doing to lift people up. People after the first whatever, the, the Chappelle one that everybody got mad about. I was like, you could take all of this energy and talk about comics that you like. Yeah, that, that's what free speech is, is beating your speech with better speech. Like, that's what it is. Right. And so if you want that idea to go away, then you beat it with a with speech. Yep. That's what. And so if you're just like, oh, that made me want to watch the special more than it did make me want to like hate it. And I know that like, but and listen, Marketing. I don't want. I don't. Yeah, it's, it is. And so that's why they probably do it, because it drives people, it drives traffic to the thing. I couldn't agree with that more. You are not in competition. If if Joe Kilgallen gets something, it doesn't mean he got it over me. I'm not in competition with with Joe. If Joe does well, I'll be on Joe's podcast again and that and I'll get that rub and vice yeah. versa. If if Joe starts fucking skyrocketing to the goddamn moon, Guess who's friends with Joe? Me. I want Joe to well, do that. If I skyrocket, I think I have to cut the list down. You know, I can't have, I can't be bringing everyone with me. You know. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. No, you're 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 along for the ride. <laughs> Andre uh, Dawson, Nirvana. God, we got stuff oh, in common, We got baby. some connections, man. No, for <laughs> sure, dude. It's one of those things where um, a rising tide lifts all boats. An expression I've always enjoyed. And look at uh, what, look at what look at what as 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 much as people. Like, think one way about Joe Rogan or whatever. His friends benefited from this. Yeah. Ga Gail King, Oprah's best friend, benefited from Oprah doing well. I know Stedman's name. And like, that's the way it should be, though. Like, Sonic Youth told their record label, you need to hear this band Nirvana. And that's how they got on. I love hearing stories like that. You know what I mean? Bring... You know, like, obviously, unless you're like head to head competition, and it's a sport, you know what I mean? No one's in direct competition with each other. You could lift people up. So do it like we're talking in the world of entertainment right now, you and I, but whatever world you're working in, like root each other on. I think it's just a better world in which you're trying to pick people up. You got friends out there. Tell them they're doing a great job. Help them with shit. Everyone. But I know there are some friend groups that are in competition with each other. I've witnessed it. I've seen it where it's like, yeah. oh, so-and-so just got their basement redone. I've got to get a new deck. I've got to go do this. And then it's like you're working harder at the job you already hate to keep up with your friend. But is this your friend or is this someone that you're just trying to be better than to make yourself feel like you're not a loser? It is right? such a you... fucking terrible existence to be in this pursuit of like one-upsmanship over material things with your supposed friends. And, and comedy is such a it's such a personal thing to people that when somebody gets something or whatever, people will hate them. If it's not their turn, people like, 
So at the end of like my show, I have like one of the things that I love to do is be like, who who do you think is great that my listeners might not know? And and it's fun to people hate that question sometimes because it's just like there's politics involved in it or whatever. But um, it's fun for me to be like, okay, and I'll mentally check off names. I was watching Comedians of Comedy in 2005, and Maria Banford and Pat Oswald were at a radio station. They're like, who are some comedians you guys? think that we should look out for who are up and coming and they're like louis ck um andy kindler uh jackie cation howard kramer and i remember writing these names down Did they mentioned morgan murphy morgan murphy yeah they yeah. like uh yeah uh there was just like a list of eddie pepitone i want to say was on there and i remember writing these names down and then like looking them up and then you meet you come to la you meet jackie cation you meet like howard kramer and you're like oh that's the guy that's the woman you know, so it's always like the first Nirvana want. CD I owned was Incesticide, which was like B-sides and unreleased stuff that came out between Nevermind and In Utero. Came out in '92, and I I got in Nirvana like at, like a year or two after Kurt died when I was like 12 and '96, '97, I think. Anyway, um, it was at Kmart or or one of those stores. It wasn't Target yet, and I bought that album. I'm cutting you off to tell you the same thing along the same lines. Kurt in the inside jacket was talking about a lot of bands he liked and he mentioned dinosaur jr and he mentioned like the vaselines and he mentioned um meat puppets which later went on to be on their own plug yeah and it made me look them all up and i'm like oh these bands are great because it's almost I bought like a sh- i bought a shonen knife cd because of kurt cobain yeah because it's almost like oh i'm interested in it first of all you're interested in in who the people you like are interested in to see that's what inspired singa- them that's a girl group from singapore yeah, like how did he discover them? I always wondered. They were pretty rad, though. Yeah, I mean, they had yeah, L7 who was good, and there's some other band. Yeah, he he had good taste. Um, but yeah, but think about that. I just wish people had more of that kind of thinking um, about lifting each other up a little bit more instead of like, dude, I just got a promotion. It's like, oh, you did cool. Well, um, you know, I'm still making more money than you. You know, there's there are people like they won't say it directly like that, but they do that shit. Because it's how they they feel good about themselves at the expense of their friends by almost putting That's them down. I, mean. I don't know. That person needs you need therapy or something. Like I. Oh, everyone they do. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just it's just like let people shine a little bit. Like it's they're not gonna. I don't know. Like if if you think somebody there's people who got famous or whatever and I never heard from them again. That is, that is true. Yeah, but, it know. happens. But you know what, though, it's still you'd rather be the person that cheers everyone on and roots for people than to be the person who. And I've been the person in the past. I I was that person for a minute or two that was like, "Fucking so and so just got that." Are you fucking kidding me? They suck. You don't want to be that person. It's not a good look. They used to um, call comedy cancer. They used to call that comedy cancer. As in, uh, the the people who did that the most, they were always done with comedy within six months. The people like. I remember somebody said maybe it was Pete Holmes. They're talking about like the people mad about Aziz and sorry. Like Aziz was like 20 and was like blowing up in New York. And people were fucking furious. Because he skipped his turn. He skipped yeah. his turn. And so, you know, Bobcat Goldfade in Boston skipped his turn and like, you know, uh whatever that guy's name was, like uh, Lenny Clark was like hated him. You know, people yeah. hated Bo Burnham because he was he got big on use the first comic to get big on YouTube. Same thing people with Dan Cook and Rob, Rob, Rob Delaney and Twitter. Yeah, Rob Delaney and Twitter, right? So there's always examples with the Joe Kilgallen and TikTok, hopefully. Joe there's, Kilgallen always, and TikTok. there's already a bunch of guys who've gotten big off of TikTok way before I'm even cracking any eggs open. Um, I had a, but yeah, I worked with I worked with I worked with Bert Kreischer when I was the feature. He's doing He's playing at like the Rose Bowl and shit. And our host was John Christ, who's got like a million fucking TikTok people now too. I'm the only yeah. person that's not like millions of followers on. Well, the next online. app is going to be Brido's. It's going to be your app, the next one. Wow, that's it. We're looking forward to it. I'm sure there'll be another one. There's always going to be another one. Um, well, that's the quote, everyone. I'll say it one more time. We should be lifting each other up and cheering one another on. Not trying to outshine and one up each other. The sky would be awfully dark with only one star. So think about that. Try to uplift the people in your life, help them out a little bit when you can, and hopefully they do the same to you in return. Um, 
but that's not why you do it. You do it because it's just a good, it's good to help people. It's good to feel good. You know what I mean? It's good to, it's good to feel good. It might be one of the dumber things I've ever said, but it's, um, I don't know. I think that's just a good, that'll help you throughout your life. If, um, if you look to, if you take a second to think, um, who, who could I push forward? Right. And pay, 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 also, pay forward is the impression. <clears throat> But also Derek Jeter in his 19 part documentary had a quote that fucked me up and he was like, loyalty in one direction is stupidity. And that made me think, you know what? Um, there's some people that I need to uh, kind of stop being their champion too. Damn dude. That's a great one. And there are some people on my list that I got to back off of too. You know it's what like, I mean? I, I seem to be, uh, seem to be putting in a lot of work on your behalf. Yeah. There's uh yeah, it's weird how that works. That's a sad thing. And that's a whole nother podcast we could have. And I'm going to have you on the podcast again. Um, we didn't really get to talk about it. Uh, you have a book you wrote. Yes. Um, we talked about that when you first started writing it cause you were, I think you had chapters available on Patreon or no. Uh, yes, but it's things have changed. So the, I got a, I got somebody to, pub <clears throat> to publish it. It needs to be down to 75,000 words. That's like 40% of the book I need to cut. And I keep telling myself it'll make for a tighter, better book. But it's like kind of painful a little bit to be like, this story's got to go. This one's got to go. Yeah. Well, there you and go. It, you put it on your Patreon though. Yeah. I could be like, these are the deleted scenes. Like this is the, because it's like, maybe this story is like a hilarious drinking story that we all told, but it's like this, people might be like, what does this have to do with the history of comedy in Chicago? Sure. Sure, yeah. definitely. Well, when the book's about to come out, I'll have you on again, and we'll see if uh, we can move some units, as they say. And uh, thank you. And then I have an album that will hopefully be dropping in a few months. I gave notes on the on the edits, and uh, I think I'm going to call it Hustle. I like that title. I like a good one word title. I was going to call it Sophomore Slump. It's pretty good. Sophomore Slump's cool too. But I think I I'm done with self-deprecation. I decided that people take it literally now. And people like generally generationally, uh, people used to be, uh, Gen X uh, used to like self-deprecation. It used to be an endearing thing. Now uh, Gen Z, they just take you take your word for it. If you're like, I man, I fucking suck. People are like, this guy sucks. He said he sucks. <laughs> um, if you're like, I'm the best of all time at comedy. People are like, he's the best of all time. At you should call it the best of all time then. That's not a bad title. The best of all. That is some that is funny. Title for some, though. Oh, the let me ask you this. I'm sorry, everybody. I thought funny. we were going to end on a big, there's the quote and all that. Real quick, though, what was your wife's final take on Chicago? Oh, For the listeners, hold on, don't, don't respond yet. Um, Mike Bridenstine finally got to take his wife to Chicago. Brido had lived in Chicago for years, so I already know you love it and all that. Yeah. But what was her outsider's perspective of the city of Chicago being someone who had never been there in her entire life? Okay. And grew up so, on the West Coast. so I did something unfair, which is I only we only ate shit that we could only get in Chicago. People were like, you should take her to Sushi Momo or something like that. And I was like, we have sushi in my town. That's like we have it there. And so so I was like, you can't get Italian beefs, you can't get deep dish pizza. You can't get uh, pickle hot dogs. And so that's what we had a lot of. And she was kind of like, okay, like this is this is too much. She she's like, the sauce is really good and the like on the pizza and stuff, but like she's just like she didn't she felt kind of bad about what we were consuming. So the food stuff is like I think that like I overdid it with that. She loved the neighborhoods. Like she couldn't believe how like amazing like we were in um i think mark geary from the lincoln lodge lives in irving park i think is the name of the like kind of a west uh i know that is, yeah um, it's like kind of in between like north center and yeah irving parks kind so of to like, west west of north center i think it's called irving park yeah it's like the sheridan uh blue line stuff right right around there so is <clears> she real loved, quick, yeah, my listeners there's no sheridan blue line stuff you mean sorry sorry blue line stuff Oh God! Uh, there's no Sheridan Blue Line stuff. Uh, no. <laughs> Addison, Addison, Belmont, Irving, Montrose. Addison, Addison. There you go, Addison. Okay, Sheridan okay. would be the red line, but go ahead. 
what did I take from the airport? The blue line? I, yes. All of this information I used to have in my head, and it's just gone. <laughs> I took the blue line to Addison. Jesus Christ. I should write a book about Chicago. Um, yeah. yeah. God damn. So she anyway, loved the neighborhoods. Yeah, she loved the neighborhoods. Um, by the way, I, Lincoln Square did not... Awesome. Yeah, it's like amazing. Um, she loved Lincoln Square. She so everything about it. The we went to the Art Institute, loved that. The the Bean loved that. Loved like every every aspect of it. That is like this is a city. This is a real city. These are, but I made her eat like kind of unhealthy, and she was like, I like to not look like a fat person. Well, tell her next time you could actually take her to restaurants that have like, you know, Chicago's got amazing steakhouses, For sure. amazing Italian restaurants. We've got, we've got everything here. So you could check that out next time. But I Leslie understand had a her smoker. Be like Italian beef. We're going to dip this shit. We're getting hot yeah. jar in there. Yeah. You're, you know, you're going to go through all the stuff where that you really can't get in other parts of the country. Yeah. I wanted Portillo's or Al's beef and I wanted Pequod's or Lumonati's and I, she liked the hot dogs. I will say that. Like, That's good. Yeah, the hot dog with the sport peppers. Come on, everybody likes that. She wanted to put ketchup on it, and I said, "I think it's fine." I think I've talked to you about that. It's fine. And did she think? Um, oh my god, was she expecting it to be this violent hellhole that she hears about in the news? Yes. Yeah, she was, and she's like, "But isn't it?" And I was just like, "Okay." That's like when people are like MS thirteen and forest fires in your area. Like, aren't aren't you guys yeah. stepping over like? like forest fires and MS 13 gang members and shit. It's just like, no, like that's not around here. Like where we are, that's like elsewhere. So yeah, she, she, and then the fucking, the guy, the cab driver or the Uber driver who picked her up at O'Hare and dropped her off at Geary's was telling her like tough guy. Like he wanted to impress the chick who'd never been in town and, and was like, my neighborhood is like just gun violence every day and shit like that. And it's just like, that's the way that you want to pretend that you live like cool, but like, but she shows up and like, she's expecting like to duck from like gunfire and shit. It's like we're in sleepy ass neighborhood. I know that's the thing. Yeah. There's a, here, I'll tell the national worldwide listeners. There's like three to four neighbors in Chicago that yes, the violence is out of control and it's really bad, but the vast majority of the city is still pretty safe. Even when there's like, yeah, there's, oh, I, I remember not too far from my house, there was a carjacking, you know, but like, yeah, I mean, in a big city, there's going to be some crime like that here or there. It sucks when it happens. You hope it doesn't happen again. You hope it doesn't happen to anyone you know. Um, but for the most part, I mean, I, I do shows in all over the city. Most of the bars, like downtown, most of the bars and restaurants are packed. It's not letting people, it's not stopping from people from living their lives. Um, I think it's just the problem with now is like we talked about throughout the theme of this podcast, social media, you're spending your day on Facebook. And every time you log in, someone shares every little crime statistic. There's always been crime, but when, before the internet and before 24 hour news networks, you just lived your fucking life. You know, someone would say, if you're going over there, be careful. That's all they would say. Hey, eh, where are you going? Eh, walk on the other side of the street. Like that, you know, they'd say shit like that. Now it's constant. Everyone's like, oh, you can't go anywhere. All this, there's drag racing now. There's, by the way, you know when there used to be drag racing? 50s and 60s. Like, there's, yeah. it's, yeah, obviously, I think <laughs> in the 80s, want to like, go down, but in the 80s, like, there was bars in Chicago that you couldn't even leave without singing the blues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's end it there. Everyone, listen to Mike Bryanstein's podcast. It's called Hunk with Mike Bridenstine. Mike, uh, you could also follow him on Twitter. It's at Brido. Yes, I'm at, at Mike want to say. at Mike Bridenstine on Instagram. Thank you for having me, Joe. I have always enjoyed your company. You're one of the few guys I still go along with anymore. This has been the longest podcast I've had in at least a year or two, and I'm okay with that. There's only a handful of guests where I'm like, you know what? I'm blowing right by, uh, trying to keep this tight because it's just keep such a good conversation. Go long, baby. Go long. Oh yeah, dude. All right, cheers, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Joe Kilgallen podcast.